So main is the simplest thing. We have a build app component and run component M and just calling it it. And what this guy is doing is just joining the campus as thread that is being built on a component, right? Now the interesting bit is the app. We have a component folder um, and uh, each component has all the different components of my application separated, right? So we have a signal that installs a signal handler for control C, control C on the, on the project. We have a logger. We have the crawler itself, which is going to be a Capataz supervision tree. We have the configuration, which is what we have been looking so far of reading the config spec and resolving all the configuration values. And the AWS, which is the beefiest one that has all the wiring to have an interface for queues and topics. Uh, inside the AWS, we have how to build the AWS environment for Amazonka, the logger, so that the logging uh, information from Amazonka gets into our own logger, SNS, SQS, and some utils. Uh, and let's go really quickly through component. Build that component, imports all those guys, right? Have a component M with a tuple being returned. Uh, and we just start ca calling all the different components uh, functions and using them in a monadic uh, do. So we build, we add an interruption signal, we fetch the configuration, we build a log, uh, we um, display all the things, and then we do uh, build the application. So because I'm in component M and I'm using applicative notation here, the queues are going to be built, like the queues of topics are going to be executed in parallel up until everything is initialized, and then it's going to return me that. And then I'm going to build the web crawler. It's going to return me back a capitas and then return that, right? Um, more interesting is the configuration. How, how does that look like? So, spec. So I have a few things for the crawler algorithm. I'm specifying that the queue name and the topic name are Q1 and topic one. The crawler, sorry, the, crawler, the crawler logic reads those keys and picks up the queue and the topic register elsewhere. Um, the logger with the information there, AWS, this is the bit that is more interesting. We have the access key and the secret key. If those values are present, it's going to use those. If they're not present, it's going to use the Amazonka discover functionality. So Amazonka makes a really smart algorithm where it checks all the different sources of configurations from Amazon, AWS access key ID and secret access key being one of them. There's also the instance profile has access to it and just access directly. There's the profiles. There's so many things that you can set up in Amazon. Um, this one is just for testing locally because I just setting values there for local. Both of them are sensitive because they should be secret. For SNS, I'm specifying the topics and it's going to be a list of objects and the endpoint, which is um, the HTTP endpoint I'm going to access in order to send stuff to SNS. SQS, the same thing. We have queues and we have a, a endpoint where we specify what's the endpoint that we're going to call. If we look at development, we have configuration for all of those. Uh, we say the access key and the secret key are those. SNS topic is going to be localhost 4575, which is the local stack endpoint to access the SNS service. And these are the topics that I'm going to be uh, calling with their ARNs. How do I find those ARNs? By looking at the AWS uh, responses from um, the AWS CLI call. So for example, this topic, if I go and look up in here and do I think local stack look list subscriptions it's going to tell me hey you have a uh, uh, the topic ARN here right so i'm getting i'm literally copy pasting this and putting in a configuration value after the application built, like after all the resources are created out of pan um Going back, where are, where is it? 
sorry. Development. Config development. Okay. And for the SQS, more or less the same thing. I have an endpoint for SQS that is that one. And these are the queues that I'm going to be calling. The URL also I found it from the AWS endpoint. But I'm going to add a toxic to it. I'm going to say that I want a toxic proxy created for this queue. The host is going to be that one, and the port is going to be this one. So what this does is, as soon as that configuration is in, the project is going to create a toxic proxy, uh, proxy through the CLI, right? And uh, it's going to map it to be that URL from the queue. And uh, it's going to wire all those things together. And the application in Haskell is actually going to call that uh, endpoint rather than the local stack one. Um, how do I, if I, sorry. So, increase this a bit. So the way it works in a more visual setting is we have our Haskell program. When that configuration is set in, uh, it's going to request a toxic proxy server to create a proxy. Then um, it's going to perform requests to the proxy, and the proxy is going to request SQS, and then the response is going to go back. Um, one and, one and two happens at the very beginning of the program. Three and four is every time we request a pull from the queue on SQS. This bit uh, is the bit that I want to replicate for SNS. I want to be able to say, uh, I want to have a toxic for SNS as well so that it delays the pushing just to see what happens there. But um, is people... Is local stack installed already or still downloading? Gosh, it's such a fail. Two hundred megabytes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go through how the toxic proxy logic works out. Because I, I want you to help me implement this in SNS as well. So I'm going to go to component uh, AWS SQS. Oh, and by the way, um, I probably should go into how the queue and the topics are working in the business code because that bit is AWS independent. Um, we're going to go to types on source here. So we're going to have a remote queue type and a remote topic type. And we are going to wire these guys up on layer zero. Um, rem remote queue is a function that receives a number and returns a list of remote messages. And the uh, uh, remote topic is something that receives a text and performs an IO side effect. So the idea is I'm able to, on my uh, layer two, ask uh, either stream queue with the name of the queue, and I will get back a remote queue that I can fetch from. And uh, the same for um, publishing a message to SNS. At this point in time, my algorithms are not talking in terms of AWS at all. I don't want that implementation detail to leak on my business logic, because if I want to change AWS, I'm, if I'm working with AWS API directly, I'm screwed, right? So how does that look, look like? If we go to the crawler, uh, component crawler. You wanna see, you're going to see a similar code to the one we saw before, but using remote queue and remote topic. 
um, we start by the remote queue reader being a thread that is dedicated to read stuff from SQS. It uh, calls the stream queue with the queue name, the worker count, and the pool rate that I want. Um, and stream queue, if I go to the types, stream queue just looks up for that remote queue name on the, on the, on the test of the application. If it is there, it gives me back the queue and it's gonna look forever receiving messages uh, with items per call. The worker count is to get the number of messages that I want from the queue at any point in time. If the result is null, uh, if the result is not empty, I execute the callback. Otherwise, I delay the thread a few, a few micros and then try again. And that's what stream queue is going to be doing. So stream queue, it's perfect to be monitored on a supervision tree, right? Because if that fails, I want it to co come back up as soon as possible. Uh, and I get all the remote messages uh, from that. Notice that the algorithm is making the usage of has remote queue, which um, is able to read from the app state a map between strings and remote queues. And it just reads from that remote queue automatically for us. Um, that means that we are, not like we are not setting up any communication with SQS on our business logic in order to pull it. We have only an abstraction that uh, hides that away. And um, publish message is the same thing. We have a remote topic hash map with topic names and um, remote topics, and it's just going to look for that and uh, publish them. If the topic is not there for any reason, it's just going to say, hey, it was not present. How can you screw this up if on the configuration file you specify in the crawler settings, oh, it's on the, on the spec. Like it's using these names by default. If you use, uh, if you declare queues and topics with different names than this, the algorithm is not gonna work, right? Because it's gonna look for those, it's not gonna find them, and it's gonna say, oh, I don't have anything. I have a configuration here with SQS, it says I have a queue name Q1, and this is the URL for the queue. In my application code, I'm gonna use that name, Q1, to get the remote queue out and start getting the messages, right? Uh, and the remote queue reader spec is just creating a worker spec with this IO action that is, well, it's just a Rio AMP action. It has nothing to do with Capatas, right? I'm wrapping that into a Capatas API so I can have a process spec to build a static supervision tree. Um, then we have the crawler work, worker pool spec, which is a usage of our worker pool API. We uh, create a supervisor, we um, add the pool work to it, and pool work is going to be, um, okay. We have a TBQ with a worker count, and we're gonna have send to worker, pool work, and push link. Push link is going to publish directly to SNS. Pool work is going to read from a local queue. This local queue is filled up by the SQS reader. So if we go back to where we're doing stream queue, you will notice that sent to worker, it's basically uh, writing stuff to a local queue. So I'm reading from the SQS queue into a local queue to distribute it among all my workers. And the workers are gonna be reading that. Um, I decided to do this instead of um, having directly read from SQS because I need to, like SQS returns me batches of jobs. And if I use the reader of SQS directly on my pool work, I will be sending batches of work to a single worker. I wanna streamline that out. I want to read all of those and assign them a new worker for each one of them, right? Does that make sense? So that's why I have a thread that reads just dedicated to reading SQS and then I have the pool that pulls from the local queue and delivers it to the workers. And this publish, like the way 
the, the feedback loop is going back is by calling this publish message, which um, uses the remote topic name and the payload that you're going to send to it, right? So remote topic name is URL topic name from the configuration. And uh, the algorithm running in the, in the pool just uh, passes a text, and that's it, that's it right? Um, so I build that web crawler supervision, and then I have a, a process spec list. They have a re remote queue reader spec and the worker pool spec. So I build everything that I need in order to make my supervision tree work. And then build crawler is going to fork a cap at task where the crawler spec is my only child. So I'm having the root supervisor, the supervisor that reads the SQS queue, the supervisor that reads the pool out of the local queue, and a supervisor for all the worker processes. So you see I have a supervision tree all in one, a, a really complex supervision tree. The code just hides that away because it composes cleanly by just saying, oh, I want this branch to be included in this trunk. You know? That's the way you compose supervision trees together. Um, right now, the worker count is one. Ideally, we would like to get the worker from the configuration. I think that one should be something you can help me with. Um, yeah. At this point in time, if I wanted to test the logic of the crawler, I don't need any configuration with local stack even. I just can create this contract of remote queue and topic queue with, with a local API. Right? Like I can make remote queue being uh, something that uses a TQ internally um, and uh, publish just uses the same TQ and publish it back in. So the idea is, or, or not just even local stuff. Like I can say it later, oh, I want to actually implement it in Google Cloud. I can create the remote, the remote queue and the remote topic abstractions for Google Cloud, and my business logic doesn't need to know anything about that. It starts to become a bit trickier when you're having, say, Kafka, because Kafka doesn't behave the same way a queue works, so it doesn't quite map one-to-one. -one. But as long as you build a contract that it's able to accommodate all the different use cases, sure, right? The idea is always never, ever use concrete cloud services APIs on your business logic. Abstract those away. And if you notice the SQS module, the whole purpose of the SQS module is to build remote queues using the AWS API. It's a sole responsibility. It's wiring everything up and delivers that to the state of the application so that the application is not the wiser. So let's go really quickly how, how that looks like. Uh, or better, let's go through topics first because topics is simpler. And it's, the similar, it's a similar logic. So I have a build topics, which is going to fetch the SNS service from the configuration. This fetch SNS service internally reads the configuration file and mocks um, the endpoint record of Amazonka with the, with the URL for local stack. And that gets abstracted away by the Amazon Kai library, right? Then I go and read all the SNS topics. And uh, if I get a list of topic ARNs, I go into each one of them and uh, parse a remote topic entry. Remote topic entry is a record for holding data that just have the topic name and the topic ARN. And this is the implementation of the from JSON instance, right? So as soon as I do, uh, this get config value, all the parsing strategies for from JSON are being used to parse the remote topic entry. Uh, with that in place, I build a component with a topic name, and it builds a SNS remote topic with the environment of Amazon, the topic ARN. How does that look like? It creates a remote topic with a published message that, uh, when you call it, it performs run AWS with environment and the request for publishing into the topic. Right? So this is a concrete implementation of remote topic that later 
my application API is going to use. Right? Uh, once I build all of those, I log the bug that I'm creating all of those. I create a build component for each of them, and then I return a list of tuples with topic names and remote topics, and then I just create that into an app and send it back. At that point, I provide APIs on the, on the, on the application record where uh, you have this has remote topic. Has remote topic, it's uh, something that, um, oh, sorry, returns you a hash map of text with remote topics. And I implement a function that uses that called publish message, which gets the topic name and the contents, gets the topic map out of the application state, looks up for the topic name, and performs the publish message API for that remote topic. Right? There's hash map for queues, hash map for topics. They ha have names. I address on my code the topics and the queues through their names and provide a layer two APIs that abstract away the fact that it's a hash map. This is rather arbitrary data structure that can be changed. Layers of abstraction of layer of, of abstraction, which is really nice. Um, for the SQS, it's a bit trickier because we are building the toxic proxy server or the toxic proxy proxy when we have that toxic uh, parameter, right? The logic starts more or less the same. I create the SQS service from the configuration, and then I iterate over all the queues. Uh, I get the remote queue entries that have the queue URL, the queue name, and the queue toxic, toxic info. This is new. The queue toxic info, it's a toxic proxy info that comes from here that has the toxic proxy name, which port it's listening to, and what host, and what are the toxics that I want in. Uh, with that toxic proxy info parsed, going back to this algorithm, and go and I run uh, this algorithm that, first of all, checks that there's a toxic info. Um, is anyone familiar with this bit? What is going on there? So I have a bunch of IOs that return maybes. And I want to compose those maybes staying in IO. I don't want to wrap, unwrap those maybes outside the IOs in order to do that. Because in the end, I'm only interested in the maybe monadic behavior that if one if nothing, returns nothing for all of them. I temporarily create a maybe T transformer. And I wrap all my um, things that can fail with the maybe T. So build toxic proxy from URL is a function that is, returns IO maybe. And by doing maybe t in front of it, I may immediately make it a function that works on the maybe t monad. I compose that with the Q toxic info, which is a pure value that is wrapped inside a monad with a return and then with a maybe t. Compose those two and get the result back. This reduces me a few lines of code because now I don't have to do do io and get maybe case, do io and get maybe case. I just do that in one go. This is really common way to do maybe t's. And that's like, instead of thinking of having a stack where you have a maybe t, you have to think of maybe t as really discardable things that you can add on the fly, right? You, you never ever want to have a application function that has the maybe t, maybe t type in it. You always want to wrap it on the fly like this and it's compose it. Pure. Huh? Uh, specifically specifying constructor? Um, yeah. Because you're on the maybe t, right? Or return if you are from the uh, monad camp. Although it's, so since it's not working. Um, huh, interesting. It's saying that it doesn't know about. No, it seems it doesn't like it. Never mind. You gotta be explicit and say some maybe t. That's weird. I wouldn't expect yeah, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's not what I want. You're failing now. 
Why did I do wrong? In this case, given that you already have a lever, would it then be nicer to run XFT instead of maybe two? So you would compose everything inside the lever instead of having to either, maybe, either, because. Um, yes. Um, you have to unify all the different data structures into one. Um, the thing is, you don't want to you don't want to compose at the upper level because the upper level works for all the th entries. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but in the body here, we can see first we case on left, right, then we have we case on maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. Pardon? Left. 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 Sorry. Oh. Okay, so <clears throat> once I have the toxic information and I know I was able to get a URL from that, I, if I get nothing, means I don't need any toxy proxy. So I'm just gonna build the queue using build SQS queue. And this guy is doing uh, this funky thing with the second because when I look at build SQS queue, uh, it's doing it inside a circuit breaker. So I'm creating a circuit breaker with the false circuit breaker options. Oh, sorry. And uh, I'm wrapping the original function into a circuit breaker that it's going to fail fast in, if things are failing often. Uh, I'm getting rid of the circuit breaker instance because I'm not doing anything with it. Like you may be able to return it and say, I want to know the status of the secret breaker, right? Like the only thing that you can do with a secret breaker uh, status is read it and say, oh, it's open, it's closed, right? For telemetry purposes. But I argue that it's a better idea to have a callback that gives you events and you just wrap the event caller of your application to log that. Um, then we have the, the, all the contracts of remote queue there. We have a remote, like every remote queue returns a remote message. It has both a body and a delete message. Body is the payload of the, of the message passed on the queue. The delete message is an instruction that tells SQS, hey, I'm done with this uh, message, remove it from the queue, right? I'm extracting that out as an IO action, not as something that uses AWS in any way. Like if you see the implementation of delete, of delete message here, uh, it hides out the AWS bits of it through closures on the build SQS queue. Right. So I'm building all the contract, partially applying all the functions that I need, plugging them into records and giving it to the upper layers. This is what people normally do with interfaces. And people have, a lot of new beginners have this misconception of, oh, I'm just gonna map uh, Java interface to a type class. When in reality, what you wanna do is have a record that has all those functions as attributes, and you partially apply the bits that you need uh, for making it successful. In this case, in the AWS environment, you partially apply that, and you build a record that has all those functions with state embedded in them. In the end, I like, I like to say that closures are porous man's object-oriented programming, because you are adding a state to functions, uh, but they don't lose their function contract in the, in the process, which is really beneficial. Um, so that's what, what remote message does. Like if we look at remote message on the types, we have a delete remote message that is an IO subroutine, right? And uh, receive messages, something that receives a number of messages and returns an <laughs> IO. And that guy has partially applied all the AWS details and performs all the AWS requests. So once that's there with the SQS, that's in the case we don't have the toxic. If we have a toxic, we're gonna get a proxy info. And then we're gonna say, build a toxic queue with the proxy info, the queue URL and the environment. Build toxic queue is going to go ahead and perform requests to the proxy CLI server. And it's gonna build a component for that. Meaning when I create a component, I'm going to create the queue. In, or the proxy on the server. As soon as my application is done, I want the proxy gone. And that's what this guy is doing. So the allocation is creating the proxy on an HTTP request. The deallocation is 
removing the proxy from the, with an HTTP request. And then I build an SQS queue with the queue URL from the toxic po uh, proxy host instead of the original one. And, it's, and, and build SQS is, is not the wiser. Like, this API doesn't care if the QRL, QRL is, is the toxic proxy server or the original local stack or AWS, right? Um, and with that, I already have a, a, a queue that is toxic. And say, for example, right now we're having, uh, if I do toxic proxy CLI um, list or proxies, proxy list, uh, no, list just list. It tells me I don't have anything because no application, no crawler application is running. As soon as I start running a crawler, you will see the queue proxy there. If I kill the crawler, it's gone, right? So my component API strategy there make sure that the cleanup is happening. If that cleanup it doesn't happen, the next time it goes in, uh, Toxic Proxy is gonna return a 409 saying, hey, there's already a Q1. I cannot do anything about that. So with that component in place, I can be working on my REPL, loading things, and nothing happens. Uh, I, I don't get invalid states like those. Um, so what should we do now? If you, have the, if you were able to have the application running, I would love for you to try it out and run it yourself on your machine. You have a way to start it by uh, sending a test message over the queue, check out the make file for local stack. It has all the things that you need. And um, after you have that application running, I want you to help me uh, do a toxic uh, strategy for SNS as well. Because right now it's just for uh, SQS. I ideally, you would like to have a circuit breaker and a toxic. And with that in place, once we have the application running, we're going to start messing it up with uh, the toxics on toxic proxy. OK, so I'll leave you to it. <laughs> I think that's going to be all of it up until the end. Um, there's no more content. Uh, on the on the slides.